with Metro. Um, one of my <coughs> concerns still is that some of your some of the managers continue to make mistakes around the 10-day notices and stuff like that. Um, they don't know whether they have to give it to us or not, which creates an issue. Um, but I had offered to HR Don that um, SEIU is willing to pay for lunch so that we can have a meeting with all the managers and all of our leaders so that we can figure out how to communicate better, um, have better labor relations, um, and how do we work together. Maybe you can just give me a call and we can talk about it or stuff like that. I think it works really well at the county and other areas in the city also. We have that kind of relationship and it would be nice to establish that with the managers so that um, we have better labor relations. So I haven't heard back from from um, Don whether we can move forward with that or not, but that would be something really good. The other reason why we're here is because of the rules and regulations. I heard that there was some communication about um, the job descriptions and the salaries. We're okay um, with the changes regarding um, Alex approving the job descriptions because we have the meeting cover process and also grievance process that we can go through anytime a job description is changed. Metro is obligated to notify the union and we have that process. What we're not okay is with that he be responsible of approving the salaries because under the circular letter of CalPERS, it does say that uh, a governing board must approve any salaries in order for it to be pensionable. So I'll give you a copy with Gina so that you guys can read it. And so that change can't happen. We wouldn't uh, be able to agree because it does affect uh, our members' uh, pension and stuff like that. So I'll leave this to you guys so you guys can read that. Um, I think there's nothing else regarding this, and thank you very much. So, yeah, we raised concerns about the rules and regs at the last meeting, and it was because section <coughs> one and number four and section six contradict each other and the sense that they both say that the HR and the board of directors establishes positions. And by definition of established, from an email that I got from the HR director here, is that established means create or improve new positions. And so she did provide clarification on number six, and I wanna read it for record purposes. Um, the Human Resource Department shall establish how employee classifications. Section six is speaking of reclassification and wage studies, not the actual creation of new positions. And then I ask her, does establish mean create new positions? Who has the authority to create new positions? Please provide clarity for these two sections. The two sections are different. For our conversation, only the board has the authority to approve new positions. And given that these two sections are contradicting each other and the intent of Metro is the board shall establish positions that should be more clear because emails that assure, assures the <coughs> union and uh, the minutes from this meeting are going to be long gone before you know in the next 20 30 years if you look at the last time this has been updated it's been since 1987 so this is going to you know go past everyone here and we need to make sure that this document is very clear that the board is the only one that creates new positions. Um, and I also wanted to provide an update on the CalPERS direct pay. The other issue we brought up at the last board meeting, Alex and Don have assured us that we will meet and negotiate prior to them implementing that process. So, thank you. Good morning, board members. Michael Rios, uh, PSA chapter president. Um, I have some concerns regarding the uh, direct pay. Um, it's not on the agenda, agenda today, but I did want to bring it up. Um, we're still waiting on some clarification from Metro on where they want to move forward or how they want to move forward with direct pay. Um, so um, if they can get back to us and let us know um, on, on how we're going to move forward with that. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Chair, I just wanted to uh, get clarification because I think we talked about some of these issues in our uh, personnel committee last Friday. Um, and uh, my understanding uh, is 
that uh, new positions would be approved by the board, changes in the job description would not necessarily come to the board, and the salary schedules would still be approved by the board. That's correct. So, um, okay. so I, 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 the way I understand the concerns that were just raised uh, is, I, I think that we thought sought to address okay. those. Um, and, I, and if there isn't, we can talk afterwards. But, no, the, the, but we we had a we had discussion during the uh, okay. uh, committee meeting about this very issue. Thank you. So this issue came with uh, two of the lower <coughs> and uh, first of all, if there's a process for uh, changing job descriptions, and basically we don't need to see every one of those changes in every job description that would be done by the staff, like Alex. Uh, and his staff, and uh, if in fact there's not agreement about that, the uh, uh, labor organizations have a way to get to the board. Uh, ultimately, if they have it, if they're unhappy with what's happened, I don't think it should be. So I like the way it's been written, that it's not automatically that every one of these job changes comes to us. It only comes to us if there's a disagreement and can't be resolved at a lower level. As far as the other issues concerned, there's no question that uh, under state law and other ways that the board has to approve any salary changes. That can't be done by uh, staff and we also have the absolute authority and they will not create any new job positions in this agency without the board knowing that they're creating new job positions so that, I think that's very clear this has been before us now twice at the board and twice at our committees and I think it's time to move ahead with it um, there's absolute assurance that, that what the uh, labor organizations are concerned, are concerned about they're, they're, they're not going to have a problem with it because if nobody on this board believes that somehow the staff or the staff members don't believe that they have the right to make either approval of changes in salary or brand new positions that the board hasn't approved. So I would recommend we leave it on the consent agenda and approve it. That's my that's my recommendation. You, of course, can do otherwise. The other All right. Um, yeah, right at the end of the agenda, I've had some issues with how I get to it. It's, it's your first day. I'll catch up for you. Um, so, I think we are um, additional documentation. Is there any additional documentation? Are available at the back of the room and we can put them online and the accomplishments from the year in review of the process that we have that Alex will address in the year. Great, so there's some material interesting material in front of you. Nothing's critical for our meeting today. Next, we come to the consent agenda. This is a, a matter in which we will pass in a single way. Unless somebody on the board wants to pull one of these, we will address items 901 through 916. And uh, think, so, if anyone wants to pull any of these consent agenda items, I don't want to pull, but I have a quick question. Okay. Uh, and it has to do with 915, which is the uh, video technology, the contract to, to uh, complete the uh, installation. I'm just curious what the experience has been. I mean, I'm, I totally support this, but maybe tell us in your oral comments or reports, you could just allude to that. Well, you, you don't need to pull it. Well, you just, do it on he has to leave early, so I don't get to it. Yes, Mr. Chair, Director, uh, the experience has been good. Now, this, this this particular item just adds funds to provide another, I think, six cameras on our bus fleet. The remainder of the fleet, we won't be adding cameras to because they will transition uh, as we replace a lot of buses in the next couple of years. Um, many of the incidents that we wanted a full video for, we've not been able to because they unfortunately happened buses that didn't have cameras, mm -hmm. so we do need to get that process completed. Um, but it has been good for us. Um, there have been several instances where there was uh, a customer complaint, for example, that uh, represented the uh, exchange with the operator in a certain way, and we were able to go to the video, which also included the audio, and actually determined that the operator acted in a very professional manner, and so the customer was actually escalating things. Um, we have also obtained some video that's helpful for us in protecting us against potential lawsuits down the road where, say, there's a passenger fall, we'll capture that video um, in case that person ends up um, filing a suit against us, we'll have video showing what really happened in that particular instance. So it's been very good. It, it is a bit time consuming because um, video is, is somewhat of a slow process to go find what you're looking for and capture it, but it's valuable. I know there was anxiety in some parts when we started, but it sounds like it was not been, um, there have been gross problems associated with 
Okay, thank you. Okay, item 906, which is the Air Crews Operations Status Report. I understand we've had some issues. Um, a new manual uh, was come up and uh, respond that uh, in terms of lateness because of a particular uh, change that's going on in three updates and what's going on. We don't need a full site now. Good morning, Directors. Daniel Zaragoza, Operations Manager at Terracruz. Um, yes, we did uh, with the, the changes initially. The first few days, we had a few hiccups. Of course, it, we're transitioning to brand new software. It has a different way of operating. Um, we've been adjusting it. You know, the, the first week was really rough. Um, you know, it, it had a way of looking at things where um, Ecolane wants to be as productive as it can with the ride. So it's looking more at um, sort of like a fixed route system. So if somebody is going from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, it's picking up and dropping off along the way. So people weren't used to that. The windows changed. We used to have windows in 15 minute increments. Now the software tells us where the windows start. So a window could be at 943 instead of 945. People weren't used to that. Uh, we, we've been working with Ecolane every single day. Actually, yesterday I was on the phone with them. We're, we've been fixing all these issues. And since that first week, we've gotten a few complaints, but they're actually complaints that no matter what operating system we would have had, trapeze, Ecolane, whatever it might have been, we would have been late. We've had issues like, um, Valentine's Day, where we only had 13 operators for a 40, we needed 24 for that day. So it's, it's been an ongoing issue. We've been fixing the issues. I ran the numbers for this meeting just to compare. Last month, we, we were at 95.5% on time performance. Since equal in, we've been at 94. So it's actually just 1.5, which is still low, but, um, I'm sure next month we'll be up to normal. We've been working, the staff has been on it. We've been, um, Ecolin's been really helpful. And um, as we've been getting the report, the customer service reports, we've been responding and trying to educate the people on how Ecolin works. It's, it's a lot different than what Trapeze did because Trapeze, everything was manual. So this is automated. The computer decides the times, the pickups, so it's way different. And I think as people get educated on how the system works, uh, we'll see a huge improvement. Sure. Just one question. How are we communicating with uh, um, our customers about this? We have been in contact with them. We're, we're trying to explain <laughs> what's going on, how it works, so that they understand it a little bit better. People aren't very happy with if they're riding from, let's say, Watsonville to Santa Cruz, they weren't used to us stopping and picking up other people along the way. We were sort of like a taxi service where we would pick up a couple of people, drop off a couple of people in the same vicinity. Now what it's doing is picking up and dropping off along the way. But we've been talking to people. We're getting them to, to their appointments on time. So I think, you know, the, the, there's, there's been a huge improvement. The first week was, was horrible. It was really bad. Thank you. Mm. Any other questions? Yes. How is the technology with the clients? Uh, do they understand it well enough to be in the education process? Is there a barrier to them understanding um, that part of the Well, it's, it's just a different, a different um, way of using it. They still call both their rides the same way. We give them the time. We put them up to, uh, within that window. So it hasn't changed that much. I believe next month um, we're going to have an app that the person will be able to go to the app and look at where their ride is, possibly even book a ride in the future on it. So it'll be sort of like an Uber app where they can go and say, where's my ride? And it'll show them where, where we're at real time. So I'm looking for a motion for the consent agenda. I would move the consent agenda. Motion by John. Second. 
Any other comments? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, our next item is the presentation of employee longevity awards. Uh, we have an award for uh, William Dove, who is recognized as president in January. So no, he's saying no. Yeah. No, we recognized him already. That That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll start the other segment. I mean, first, I'll start with the information. Also, not wishing to speak this morning, <laughs> David Moro uh, Guerrero is a ve uh, vehicle service detailer who's been working with us for 10 years and we recognize his service. However, I believe uh, Raimundo Marquez may be here, and he is, we'd like to appreciate him. Do you want to make any comments? We may not be. Good morning, everyone. How, how's every, everybody doing? Well, my name is Steve Marquez. And I started working here in 2008. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, 2000. Many years ago, right? So it's, 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 it's very, 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 very long, long time yes, to, to calculate how many years, right? If I got it this morning, get up and start coming like, what I can use it to count those years, you know? I start with my fingers and then it is with my toes, right? So add them up, 20 years. So who can, who can remember those, uh, those years, you know? When um, you turn 20, 25, 30, and then those days when the, you call the, the body parts for the right name. So you call, for example, you used to call right knee, left knee, 20 years later, you used, you will call it uh, the good one and the bad one. <laughs> that's what I want to see, that's what I want to see here in the metro. Lately, I see me every morning like kind of, I want to see people laughing, I want to see people be more empathy with each other. And the end of the day, everybody will want to go down there. It's not about, it's not about who's got the power. It's not about who's got the more money. It's not about, I'm the one who's called shots. Even the, the more is more creature in the, in the planet is very important. For, for the living of the, uh, all the people. And um, I take this time, yes, to, to remind those kind of things because I, I grow in, in, in one area where it's freedom like hell. I mean, you look in the village and you say, there's your land. You can go side to side, no restrictions, nobody mess it up, nobody get mad, nobody went out. And these days, oh my goodness, we need to work it out each other a little, a hard empathy. Because at the end of the day, like I said, it's not, a, it's not my business, it's somebody else's business. It's everybody's business. I mean, I've seen so many things happen. Can I tell a little story about what happened in Metro when the, we had the old building? Sure. Yes? Yeah. So, we had the old building right there and we, we had the watcher in front of the building. And I was working one of the bus. And that time that was the, I don't remember, zero, the, who's zero down here? Right the, here. Right here. The, <laughs> the last manager that was a Ryan or Brian? Brian. 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 So that, that guy, I mean, there was, there was a guy, he was all over the place. And he's, I'm gonna talk, it's a little serious stuff, but we were talking one of the drivers passed away. So he came out from the dispatch and he was screaming because they reported somebody was down down there. He reported, says, anybody know CPR? Anybody know CPR? So I stopped doing my job and I said, hey, I know CPR. So we went down there. It was probably too late. It was too late. We went over there, we found the person in the past. And in my mind, 
goes to my mind and I say, what are we going to do here? I mean, so many people around and this person gone. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not talking about like it's people's fault or whatever. But at the end of the day, that's what I say. We need to have empathy for the people and work it together and help each other and a smile every day. Like the way you guys did a couple minutes ago, everybody. All right? So I'm mean, happy to work here. I'll, 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 I'll keep my pride for the rest of my life because whatever, what, to me, to me, I had a hard personality. No matter what, what people change, they will not change me the way I'm thinking. Nobody will, you know? Right now, I'm sorry for this, but most of, most of, the, most of the people, especially young generations, that are involved with the media and those kind of things, and most of the time, we don't focus on our lives. We just go over there and get the phone, get the phone. We go to dinner and we get the, the phones and families over there, over there, over there. When I grow up, we set it out at the table with my mom, my brother, my sisters, and she says, she's the one who serves the food and we set it out and talk in it and got a nice conversation about whatever issues. Calm and relax. Well, I hope, I hope, <laughs> I hope that I take too much time for this, but I mean, this is the kind of things we need to work it out in. For me, you know, like, it's, 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 been, it's been a real pleasure to work with a lot of people here. I had a bunch of friends around here, and I'm gonna miss them as soon as soon I, I check out from here, but I, I'm still gonna come back. I miss John, John uh, Odano, Tom Stico, for example, to mention it, some, and I was John Spacey. I mean, those guys, my God, my respect. So the last one I is going to tell a little bit about John Spacey. I don't know if you remember John Spacey or whatever. That was one of the supervisors. He used to go with, the, with me when I would take my breakfast. And the way, the way I raise, even if I don't have nothing, if uh, people around used to offer, that's the way I raise. And uh, I, was, I was eating right, and then he came and I said, Hey, John, I got a pair. I got a pair. You want a pair or mango, whatever you want? He says, no, Ray, you do a lot of work. You need the food for the energy. I mean, for the, for the energy. And I say, no, you, I like the chair. Don't worry about it. And, and, I, and I was very clear. I say, not because I offer you this and this and this, I'm going to be asking for favors. I'm very responsible. I'm a very uh, professional person. If it doesn't matter if I talk with you very friendly or something like that, when it, when it comes to the situation, we're talking about work, nothing to do with that. We can still talk very nice as a friends, as a human beings, and we can still be responsible. And what do you need to do? It's a lot of easy just like that. I believe more encouraging than punishment. Thank you.
he represents the VSW as well. He says some very important things that we need to do. Thanks, Alex. Okay, yes, go ahead. Excuse me, uh, we do have Theodora. He, he oh. is here and uh, he's going to step up to the table. So, we'll have to interrupt and make some comments as well. And we're recognizing, we're recognizing 20 years of service. Another senior, Buenos Dias. Who wants to say um, good morning? Yeah, Children also work here. He said it was very appreciative to be here and have this job. And it's been a very good experience. He wants to share a little story that he's had in the last 20 years. Thank este, cuando entró el, el señor Ciro, yo no sabía que era el supervisor. Nuevo, y él entró al bus. Y yo le dije, hey, no puedes entrar aquí, tienes que salir. Quieres una aplicación, ahí estoy afuera. Le dije, ¿qué buscas trabajo? ¿De qué trabajas? Y dijo, soy tu voz. He said, you look to work. He says, no, you need a job. And he says, no, I'm your boss. He said, okay. He said, okay. He said, oh, Daniel, un amigo, por cuidar a mis hijos, que los conoce. Y pues agradecido. Gracias. He says, thank you to Daniel, who gave the opportunity for his kids to come in here as well. And he's just really grateful. Gracias. We have uh, two retirements this morning, and uh, one's for Jeffrey Zinker, who I believe is not here. And also for Dan Stevens, who had this year, who's been here, served this district for a very long time. They put some comments. We would like to invite him up to make those comments. I can't hear Chris. I can find him. Thank you very much. Those are two my eggs to follow. I'll keep it short. I just fast the last few days. I'm a little weak and a little tired. And I said that four score and 20 years ago. Actually, it was uh, one year and 20 years ago. I started working for the Metro. And uh, boy, time's flown. Uh, it seems like yesterday. Um, but a lot of things have changed. I remember back in 1998 when I started, we actually had a, uh, a government that respected the Constitution, for example. Um, we had a Senate that was interested in passing legislation. Uh, we had a Justice Department that was interested in law and order. Um, we didn't have cyber attacks from a foreign country in our elections. So a lot's changed since then. And it's, uh, it's good that I'm retired because it gives me an opportunity. Oh, also one thing I didn't have back then is I didn't have a pension. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> and that gives me the opportunity to do some volunteer work and I'm volunteering to help get the vote out and volunteering for the elections office. And I'm doing that because I take the, uh, the threats to our democracy very serious. And so I hope all of you take your uh, right to vote very seriously and do what you need to do to, um, to keep democracy going in this country because it's now just like that.
I would move the uh, the uh, all the resolutions. Motion by John for the resolution, second, second by Bruce. Um, I just want to say about Dan. Um, you've been here quite a while, and I've been here as well. And um, like many of our uh, employees, he hasn't simply he's done his job. He's done a great job of doing his job, but he he also is someone who's interested in the overall uh, well-being of the district and the service to the customers and been a kind of an active citizen of the district. And I, I appreciate that. I want to thank him for that. Uh, in addition to the actual job, specific job he was hired to do and, and did well. Thanks again for your service. Yeah. Um, okay. I think need to vote. So we have a motion, second, <laughs> for the resolutions. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? There is you now. So thank you, John, for being here. I'll be in trouble with that. <laughs> 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 We now have a, uh, a uh, oral presentation from uh, uh, Veronica Elsie, the NAC chair. I see how my aim is. <laughs> hey, morning, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the next time I'm up here, there'll be a doggy. <laughs> that would be nice. Well, good morning, everyone, board members. I'm Veronica Elsie, and I am the chair of the Metro Advisory Committee. This is actually supposed to be our December report. Uh, as it happens, we did hold new elections in November, and I am still the chair in 2020. So if you can look at my face again. <laughs> Next year, you will have a different chair, as our bylaws say that one can be chair two consecutive one-year terms, and then you have to take a year off. So next year you'll have somebody else. Um, but this is a great committee, and I want to start by giving a shout out to our two new members, James Vaughn Hendy and Jessica DeWitt. We're really happy to have them. And for the last really several years in a row now on this committee, we have never had more than one person missing at a meeting. So our attendance has just been spectacular. The participation at the meetings is good. Everybody gets involved in the discussions. We cover a lot of different things. And you have a committee here that really, really wants to function as an advisory committee. Uh, the couple of little things that we are running into is, according to our bylaws, we meet quarterly, and it's the third Wednesday of whatever month we choose. And in November, we chose for 2020 to meet in February, so that was the 19th. April, that will be on the 15th. August, that will be on the 19th. And then we picked October on the 21st. We often would do November, but we're trying to dance around the board schedule, and you guys keep canceling your December meetings. And so um, we also try to schedule it so that the third Wednesday gives us a week before your meeting, so that if we do want to send you any kind of communications, we can get them into the office by Thursday so that they make it into your packets. So we were kind of batting things around a little bit at our last meeting about maybe, you know, in future amendments of the bylaws, we might want to say, you know, the Wednesday a week before the board meeting, because you have some months where you haven't been doing the fourth Friday, you've been doing the third Friday. So that cuts it a little close for us. And since we are only quarterly, um, that we really want to make sure we cover the issues and have the ability to get um, information to you if we feel like we need to. So that might be something to just take a look at when you're looking at our bylaws and yours. Um, the other thing that sometimes happens since we are quarterly, if an item gets tabled, we had a couple of members that want to have some interesting discussions about alternative fuels, and that poor item just got tabled again, and so the problem is when something gets tabled, it's tabled for three months. And so we're trying to be really careful to make sure that any of our questions don't get outdated. And 
So we're, we're having to work very carefully to balance that and stay up to date and pay attention to your current issues. We are looking forward to your extra um, staff coming on so that your marketing and customer service gets separated out from your planning and development so that we can go back to getting some of the documentation that we're used to getting in our meeting packets, things like the quarterly ridership reports that we haven't seen for a little while as part of our packets, and just some of the written background information so that people could look through those ahead of time and be able to ask more intelligent questions during the meeting and stay on time because we fit a lot into our two hours and we do end on time. <laughs> um, so I, I think those are just things that you may want to just think about when you're looking at kind of the bylaws and how we're set up because this is really a committee that is a very strong commitment towards improving Metro and keeping up with what Metro is doing. And in that regard, some of the issues that we have really talked about a lot over the past several months are from the marketing standpoint, the committee's very concerned about the marketing and outreach that comes out about your passenger code of conduct. And we understand that's been a little bit delayed until your extra staff comes on. But it's very important to the committee as to how this is presented to the public and that it communicates Metro's intent to use this so that the drivers have a backup and the public doesn't get the idea that you're trying to punish certain groups. So we're very interested in being involved in, in kind of helping with that. We've seen a lot of discussion even so far at today's board meeting about all the various apps that are coming out. One of the things that the committee has asked about is, you know, we hope that we don't get to the point where in order to ride a bus, you can choose one of six or seven different apps. And you do this one if you want to get the parking commit permit in Scotts Valley. You do this one, you know, Eco Lane is paratransit. This other one from Synchromatics if you want to find where your bus is located. And another one if you want to book your. So the committee is really stressing in our comments at the meetings that we hope that there might be some way to combine things so that there's a metro app and you can do all the various things on one app and it's not too confusing for your for your writers. And we're also been very pleased to be able to get some presentation and make comments about all the things that Metro is considering, what can, what can be done with on-demand transportation and some of the other options to counter a little bit of the Uber and Lyft and how we're going to get our riders from point A to point B when there are some areas that have lost some service. And we've had some interesting discussion about fares and we've been informed about some of the legislation um, coming up about, you know, making transit free for some people or cheaper for some people. And so we're just very interested in how it goes for people that really want to switch to transit or be able to afford transit and keep going. We also talk a lot about some of those service areas and are trying to stay on top of new developments in the county. So things like the changes that may be coming out at the Capitola Mall and the transit center out there and new employment um, locations like the potential with Kaiser and the Enterprise Center and various things that that are coming up. So we really want to stress the need to provide us with the updates in a manner that we can really provide you with good information. Users do talk to us when they find out that we're out there, which is how it came up about the fares, because everybody's been getting on the buses going, hey guys, it's free in Philadelphia and Kansas City. What are you doing? So we bring it back to the committee and we really had some good discussions about it. So um, our next meeting will be on April 15th. The public is welcome to attend our meetings right now because of the construction at the Metro Pacific Station. We are actually meeting here at 110 Vernon Street. So our agendas are online. The public is welcome. It's a great committee and we hope that the board will take some of our items to heart and 
maybe look at the bylaws and have some discussions with us about how to make us more efficient and more useful to you. Thank you. Any questions? Other questions? I can see at this time. I want to thank you and your committee for your service. I think it means a lot to us to have direct input from people who use the service and give us advice that some of us you know, don't regularly use the bus to necessarily come to understand the actual health. So thank you for that work. You're welcome. Thank you for the chance to speak with you. And I'll see you in six months. <laughs> Actually, less than that. Right. Thank you. Thanks again. Next, we have the CEO's oral report. Okay. Mr. Chair, Director, uh, just uh, three things that I wanted to report on. Uh, one, as a result of the FDA moving up the deadline for the my trials for the submittal of the bus and bus facilities grant this year, we're not going to be able to apply for our paratransit uh, bus and bus facilities grant for this year. We'll have to move it to next year. Um, we think the FTA, for whatever reason, wants to move everything up earlier this year so they can accelerate the awards probably before November. <laughs> um, but that's what we've been told. So we will do the best we can do to react to that. As we know from prior meetings with the administrator of the FTA, they rarely have ever do two consecutive years of bus facility grant awards to the same agency. And therefore, we'll hold off this year. Uh, we won't apply for a bus and bus facilities grant this year for other things in hopes of preserving our ability to win that grant next year to, to build that share transit facility. Um, so 2021 is when we will target is that. And then, as we usually talk about this time of the year, you noticed around, I'm sorry. Um, I do have a question just um, on that share transit facility. Can you just give us a quick snapshot where we are with the contract with us? That's related to this. Yeah, but I think I might jump that over to Sarah maybe just to give us a just quick update. Just quickly, Sarah. Sure. Morning, Sarah Geary, Chief Operations Officer. Um, in reference to the question posed, we have been working with SWIFT, and we are at a point where now many of the uh, environmental requirements need to come into fruition and. Uh, investigation of how that land is uh, a, pro a, a portion for the construction process. Uh, SWIFT has, uh, we've been in communication with SWIFT. They have been uh, coordinating uh, with some various uh, other subcontractors that we're going to be looking into uh, in providing those reports. Uh, it's pretty extensive because we have a, a riparian. There's some issues with uh, the elevation. Uh, it seems to be lower than the SoCal uh, Avenue. So there's a question of pumping stations that will need to be put in in order to bring uh, sewage and such up to uh, the appropriate levels. And um, all of those aspects need to be looked at. Uh, there's also some concerns about uh, the permitting and how that's going to be carrying out because uh, there's city and also county uh, concerns about that. So basically we're kind of a putting together all of the pieces so that we can get our process moving forward uh, from a permitting standpoint and getting closer to a shovel-ready project. That was, that was really my point. There's a lot to be done. <laughs> and uh, I would appreciate at least occasional updates on where we are. Absolutely. And like what we do with the Pacific Station. Very much so. Yeah, and, and just so you know, one of the uh, important milestones is to make sure that we've met with the neighborhood adjacent mm -hmm. to that, that they, they support what we're doing. So Jamie is working with Supervisor Leopold's office to try to find an opportunity to have a public meeting. Um, we hope to do that soon. I think, yeah, we're still targeting. Because um, that's an important milestone. <coughs> mm -hmm. If we find out there's going to be major opposition, then we need to drop back and, and think about what we're going to do and how we proceed before we spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That is um, part that that certainly will come out of this analysis that Swift and others are doing for us. So we we don't have a big fix yet on what that number is. At least there we have kind of an estimation of the range. Well, the environmental report came back at approximately 138,000 
just for those reports there. Uh, it doesn't include any of the other aspects that we're looking at for an overall general view of, of what's going to be required to even begin uh, seeking permits and such. Right. But the overall project could be six, six to seven six million. million. We just we obviously <coughs> narrow that down because we want to get that right. Right. Yeah. And the well, we, we uh, you, you may recall a couple of months ago, the board dedicated funding as the local match for this project. So we would probably be in the range of a 40-50% match depending on what that final number comes down. And again, that's part of the strategy is to try to make us really competitive at the federal level. But the federal money, how much are we looking to fit it? I mean, is it a $3 million house? Is that we don't know because we don't know the cost yeah. of the ballpark. Yeah. The ballpark. Three, four million depends what that kind of number is. That's, that's not unreasonable. If I may elaborate a little further, we are going to be contracting for uh, a, kind of a, a general contractor that comes in and reviews the entire uh, project as, as we're planning to go forward with, and they'll come back with an estimate uh, of what's going to be required based on a lot of the uh, analysis that they're going to be conducting. That will give us kind of a ballpark of what we're going to do. Again, as we're estimating, you know, six, seven, maybe eight million because of uh, the different pumping stations and such that we're at. It, it's close to a repairing, and, and we can't be putting the water back into that. It has to go somewhere else. So if we're looking for the good in all of this, the good is we're going to have a little extra time to try to really make the quality application. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next thing you, you notice around the room annually, we we do this exercise soon after the year with employees at all levels in the organization. We come together in this room. Uh, we spend a little bit of time asking them to try to fill the walls up with sticky notes. You have the outcome of the sticky note exercise before you in which we have them identify all the accomplishments throughout the year, no accomplishment too small. Things like uh, we have X number of procurements, we have Y number of, of uh, invoices we pay. Things that we just don't always think of from day to day, but it's important to remind you and to remind me that our employees at all levels in this organization have a lot going on besides, in addition to some of the higher level things that we're working on, you know, trying to build a new facility, buy buses, fix things. Uh, so it's a good opportunity before you start the new year and you lump on all the new things that we're going to do in the new year to just take a quick pause and say, wow, we, we accomplished a heck of a lot last year. So kudos to all of our employees at all levels in the organization. <coughs> and then we also go through a little exercise where they go off in groups and they kind of think about if, if they were the CEO, if they were the board, what would they do? What would they want to prioritize in the coming year? And you have a little bit of that information before you also about what they thought. And it's, it is interesting how much in alignment with the employees think the agency I'm going to the board is going. Um, so that was always interesting to look at. Um, so that's around you, but you have a hard copy in front of you. And then finally, I'd like to ask one movie to come up to the mic and just talk about a successful grant application that you just got notice about. Good morning, Chairperson, uh, board members, staff, and guests. I would like to give you a uh, uh, brief, uh, uh, brief step out. Uh, one of the grants we received from Kaltan uh, in February. Uh, Metro has received a, a discretionary grant award in February from Caltrans 5398 uh, in amount of 1.3 million uh, to replace uh, two 1998 CNG buses with two, uh, two 1998 diesel fuel buses with uh, two CNG buses. And this award will help achieve Metro uh, number one capital improvement, a goal of replacing our first three uh, uh, obsolete buses. Uh, I would like to uh, give this grace to the board because the board came up with the strategy of uh, uh, bus replacement fund, uh, which dedicated three million dollars to uh, this capital project. So we use that as a local match to win this grant, and um, uh, this would help us uh, to provide funding and stability to uh, for also the required local match to replace our. Fixed out in paratransit uh, vehicles. Uh, staff will continue to seek grant application for operating assistance and capital improvement project and take some <coughs> more. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Good job, they want to move. And finally, finally, I need like a little move off. I took a round of applause. So <laughs> of the discussion was Highway 1, which doesn't really include Santa Cruz County, and just until it ties in uh, Pomero somewhat on freight issues in particular. But I want to let you know that we did always put in our little, uh, I mean, not a little, we put in a big men mention about our bus on shoulder program. They're very excited about it. And I, uh, I just want you to know that uh, on another, from another agency, the Regional Transportation Committee, uh, Commission and representation there that uh, the bus on shoulder and the trade lanes is uh, uh, high profile on the, those discussions, uh, even though it's not metro in particular. It, uh, I mean, it is metro in particular, but the RTC in general, um, they, they know what we're trying to do and uh, we got a good word in. Thanks, Liz. Back to you on the next item, actually, which is the uh, federal, uh, same federal legislative agenda. Sure, let me just try to zip through this because you do have our representatives from the state and federal here. Uh, the plan is similar to the one presented in prior years. It is adjusted for whatever the little uh, new new changes are for the coming year. Of course, we continue to advocate for new and stable funding and to avoid unfunded mandates. Uh, we continue, I continue to represent you on the TDA and the past reform task force. Uh, we're looking at trying to do anything we can do at a state level to reduce the impact of the costs of uh, implementing electric vehicles. And of course, uh, a big topic this year with the expiration of the FAST Act would be its reauthorization or some new form of that, whatever may be the case. In the past year, we had success with the legislation that we sponsored through Assemblyman Stone. That was AB 1089 that made some three amendments to our enabling legislation. Uh, and, and then uh, CTA and, and others were successful with AB 784, which provided uh, the portion of the state sales tax uh, be exempt from our purchases of ZEBS zero emission buses. And on each zero emission bus, that would have a savings of about thirty to forty thousand dollars. So, compressed natural gas bus, brand new, seven hundred fifty thousand electric buses over a million dollars. Um, obviously, anything like that really helps. So we take them and we're thankful for that legislation. Um, and we talked about the FAST Act. Um, we're also excited. We've been working very closely with Congressman Panetta, and I think Chris will talk about this in a little while, but he is sponsoring legislation that would create a 10% tax credit to the manufacturers for the <coughs> buses. Of course, because of the way the IRS rules work, um, that has to be a credit to them and not to us, but of course we hope um, to very strongly assert with the manufacturers that they should pass that 10% on down to us, uh, hence the reason why it was being created. Um, and then if you, if you move on to page 14-6, I would just point out, uh, I continue to represent this agency on a number of different, in a number of different organizations, CTA, AFTA, <coughs> Bus Coalition, CTA, Cadillac, transportation, uh, TDA reform, and of course the, the Zebra or Zero Emission Bus uh, Resource Alliance. Um, so we have our fingers into a lot of things, and some of those organizations, I, I play a greater leadership role, so I'm able to help try to move our agenda through those processes as much as possible. And then if you jump over to our uh, attachment B, you'll see the state legislative agenda, which lays out pretty similarly to prior years what we are working on. Uh, many of those things carry over goals from prior years. New this year is the resiliency. Uh, as you know from our PG&E outages, where 
in the last one, uh, we were out for a little over two days, I think two and a half days. Um, this is a big issue. We're being told by the state we be 100% electric by 2040, and we have to deal with pg and &E outages of multi-day <coughs> outages. How do we deal with that? If we were 100% electric fleet um, a couple of months ago when we had a two and a half day outage, um, we would have been dead in the water, right? You know, at least on the compressed natural gas side, we were able to still compress gas and fill our, our buses because our facility has a backup generator. Um, but we don't have the room to provide enough backup generators to back up each of these and we, to charge 100 buses. Over <coughs> this is a big issue. We can talk about it at all levels. Um, we need to continue to stay vigilant and monitoring that. And then, of course, on the federal level, as Chris will no doubt talk about, Fast Act um, and, and our board committee will again in a month or so go to Washington, D.C. and talk about all the important things that we think the FDA and the government, the federal government should consider when they look at reauthorization, uh, including using fast act levels as a baseline, uh, or not using fast act levels as a baseline, but using the plus up levels, plus up over baseline, uh, as our new baseline for the coming reauthorization. Um, more money is the key. We need to see if we can bring on a little bit more money. So, Mr. Chair, Director, is that concludes the report? And I would anxiously await our report from our state federal office. I just want to make that general comment. Everybody who works in this district knows that we are hugely dependent on the state and federal governments for support. We, we also we depend also on our uh, residents of our community uh, who support us with Measure D and other kinds of sales tax issues. But the reality is the riders of our bus system are paying about a little bit more than 18% of the cost of the bus ride. And the remainder of that has to come from somewhere else. And so we would be in really big trouble if we didn't have good representation at the state and federal level. And thankfully, we were very well represented there by organizations that actually lobby for us. And this is the positive sense of lobbying, letting people in DC and Sacramento know what our needs are and help us kind of understand, help, help them understand what our needs are and how we can uh, make the system work better for the people who live in this community. So I really appreciate the work that they do. And, We'll start at the state level by introducing Josh Shaw, who's our representative, our lobbyist there, and does a fantastic job for us. Sorry, we should also approve uh, Alex's uh, report. So we can begin with our motion. Second. Second. By John. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please be unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chair and board members. I'm Josh Shaw with Shaw Oriental, Shmelter and Lang, your state advocacy team in Sacramento. I want to congratulate uh, board member Rocky on ascending to the chairship this morning, getting the recognition you've been long overdue. <laughs> <laughs> I, know you're, I know you're finding your way through the reins of leadership here. I think I accidentally just called me and him old. Um, <laughs> Uh, your CEO, Mr. Clifford, just talked about some of the highlights in your legislative program that you just adopted on the state level. He named a couple of things that are of paramount importance to Metro. And back in our firm, we've got a lot of people who are working for you and other transit agencies. I'm pleased to bring this morning Michael Pimentel, my colleague at the firm, who is has been over the last several years uh, jumping right into our public transit practice, growing more responsible in terms of taking on the duties and some of the advocacy pieces of any different transit system that we represent. And in your world, the unfunded mandates that Alex talked about, we're gonna get into a little bit on the fare free transit movement in Sacramento, and particularly on the transit electrification movement. Michael is literally the tip of our firm's spear for that effort. He's been with us many years next week, celebrates his fifth anniversary at our firm, so pleased to bring Michael this morning. He and I are gonna kind of tag team a presentation for you where we're gonna talk about key legislation, and really in three different categories, uh, several bills that have to do with that fare-free transit. And we're calling it fare-free. There would be no fares under this. It doesn't mean transit is free, of course, and we'll get into the nuances there. I'll touch a little bit on the latest funding scene in Sacramento. No, no bad news, so that's, that's uh, unlike some years in the past. And then uh, Michael will, will back clean up on the electrification piece and get into some of those details. I do want to note before Michael gets into some of the bills, uh, one of them that's in your program that you just adopted is uh, supporting the expansion of the right for transit agencies to work with the state to find right of way on your highways to run buses, bus on shoulder. Of course, uh, five, six, no, seven years ago, we, we were on the tip of that spear for you passing the original bill 
with Assemblymember Mark Stone that uh, authorized this district in partnership with Monterey to do that, and you, you are making progress on that. The statewide group's trying to replicate that um, in legislation. So that's, the, that's a, just a highlight of what we're gonna talk about. I'll jump into legislation here. Um, we are about two months into the start of the second year of the, oh, okay. I don't have that missing slide there, Gina. That's, this must be the old presentation. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's all right, no problem. The, uh, we're, in the, we're 60 days into the second year of a two-year legislative session, the 2019-2020 session. Um, you know, a lot of work was done last year. Alex mentioned uh, some of the things we were able to accomplish for you, including working with Julie and Alex on framing up your own sponsored legislation. About 2,600 bills were introduced last year. Last Friday, a week ago tonight, was the deadline for legislators who want to introduce a new round of bills in this upcoming 2020 session. About 2,200 bills came through the floodgates, most of them Friday night. So this last week, Michael and I and others in our, in our firm have been parsing through stacks of bills. We think we have a pretty good handle. I can't swear there's something that, that we haven't seen yet. Uh, I, I don't think there is. Mostly, there's not a variety of bills that have direct impact on public transit. The themes in Sacramento this year are the continued focus on housing and affordability, uh, particularly on the low-income side of housing, but also the missing middle, the challenges faced by the unhoused, uh, and, and the challenges of service providing agencies like yours and your cities and your counties that you all represent uh, in terms of the growing uh, uh, numbers of unhoused in California. The environment, of course, continuing California's leadership on, on addressing climate change. There is an interesting intersection recently in the last couple of years between California's social justice, social equity policy push as it plays out in the Sacramento capital and the more mundane, usually mundane transportation and transit policy. And that's my segue to the fare free bills that Michael will talk about. Um, specifically, there's been a movement in the last several years to decriminalize a variety of activities that state, local governments otherwise have statutes on the books. And the folks in the social equity uh, uh, world are particularly looking at other sectors to kind of turn to, and in transit world, they're looking at fares. So not only from an equity perspective, lowering the cost, but also, you know, if, if, if your agency is going after folks who didn't pay their fare or evaded their fare, there's an enforcement outcome sometimes implied. So there is a movement to, to get rid of that and make the option more affordable for more people. So that's the segue to five different bills that Michael will talk about, three of which are these fare-free transit bills. Thank you, Josh. And I'm Michael Pintel with Chavier, you should and Lang. So in years past, we have seen some free, uh, fair free transit bills introduced. At times, those were single legislators who were advancing those bills, single voices. Now we've got a chorus. We've got three bills that have been introduced this year that are looking to make uh, transit free for a variety of populations. Uh, the primary one has been AB 1350 by assembly members uh, Lorena Gonzalez out of San Diego, who would require that uh, transit be free for persons under the age of 18. Uh, we've seen additional bills that would make uh, transit free for folks that are over 65, as well as for uh, students at the UC, the CSU, and the, uh, and the California Community College systems. Uh, now, at, at this point in time, uh, we've heard from a number of transit agencies, uh, including from Santa Cruz Metro, about what this can do to your operational budgets. Uh, we understand that for uh, Santa Cruz Metro, uh, the potential uh, shortfall of fares were to be waived for any segment of the population or in mass would be close to uh, $10 million. And from uh, our knowledge of experiences during the Great Recession, we know that when Santa Cruz Metro was facing a $6 million shortfall, that led to some severe service cuts layoffs for dozens of their employees, and those are the things that we want to avoid. And so we've been um, working with transit agencies across the state to really assess the impacts of these bills. Uh, and what we're hearing, of course, are they're the obvious first order impacts. We're gonna lose fare revenues, that's gonna lead to the types of service impacts uh, I, I noted just a, a second ago. But then there are the second order impacts that we are very concerned about. Uh, of course, increased trans ridership that would come from reduced fares, fare, uh, free fares, be a good thing. However, it does lead to 
uh, increased operational pressures. You might have to put more uh, service out to just maintain the level of, level of comfortability for the folks that are traveling on your buses. Uh, we have seen that that may lead to the need to hire new operators, purchase new buses. All those things were, would come with added costs, uh, which the state is not currently proposing to fund. Uh, and this is uh, concerning, of course, because um, the legislator, the legislator who has introduced the primary bill within 1350, free fares for folks under 18, is a hugely powerful legislator in, in Sacramento. She chairs the Assembly Appropriations Committee, which uh, Director McPherson should know very well is one of the, the, the uh, key committees in the legislature for getting bills to the governor. Uh, of course, we also have a new governor in place, and while Governor Brown had vetoed similar uh, measures to what's before you today, Governor Newsom doesn't have quite the track record on these issues, and of course, he's shown uh, greater sympathy for uh, some of some of these measures that may have a, uh, a fiscal impact on local agencies. And so, uh, again, we're looking to assess the impacts statewide. Uh, with that, we're trying to then better understand what our messaging will be, what our strategy will be uh, for prevailing on the legislature, legislature uh, that is uh, generally receptive to these uh, types of bills. Uh, worth noting is that 1350 is currently in the, the Senate. When it uh, moved out of the Assembly, it passed out with uh, 69 yes votes, zero no votes. So that's just an indication of the level of support. We're trying to figure out how best to address um, the concerns that we've seen uh, and hopefully um, get the legislature uh, to approach these, these bills in a way that is um, more understanding of the impacts uh, that will accrue to the local agencies. So I'm going to highlight that. Can I interrupt just now? I mean, sure. We'll come up <coughs> the end, I guess we'll all explain right now with the chef's story on this. Do these legislators have any idea that what they're doing is taking service away from the very people that they're thinking they're helping? Between a half and two-thirds of our writers are UCSC students. That bill alone would take between a half and two-thirds of our uh, uh, fare box contributions out of our system. If you add into that the people who are under 18 and then the other bill for people who are over whatever age is 65, yeah. 65, we would end up cutting service to young people, senior citizens, and students if any of these things passed. And all of them passed, we're just dead. I mean, do they have some idea that that's the kind of thing? In other words, more, you said, we need more, the secondary impacts, you need more drivers, you need more of this, and we'd, we'd be had less of all this, fewer of all this, and less of this, not more. I mean, the system would actually not be going to the places people need to go anymore. And so, I don't, do they have any sense that that's the, that it's an unintended consequence? I know they mean well, and we've had people come to us before and say, all oh, young people should ride for free. We go, yeah, we could do that, and then young people couldn't get a bus where they want to go. Do they get that at all? So I think that what we've seen so far is that these well-intentioned bills have been embraced because folks do not fully understand the implications <coughs> for the transit agencies that serve their districts. We are starting now, though, to uh, message around this issue really highlight what those impacts are uh, so that as we move into the second house, we're in the Senate, uh, we uh, do anticipate that the bill be heard in the Senate Transportation Committee uh, come June. Uh, we're working to make sure that folks in the Senate better understand what those impacts are. Uh, we know from conversations with folks in the Senate Transportation Committee that they, the, the committee staff, are very receptive to the arguments presented. They understand what the you know, long-term implications will be for transit service in the state. And so we're hoping to have some success there. Uh, with the assembly, the bill was uh, already in motion. It's a two-year bill, meaning that you're revisiting it here in the second year of the legislative session. Um, but the winds uh, were in the sails. It was going to move forward. And in fact, there were some legislative deadlines that almost necessitated that the bill move forward into the Senate without much debate or discussion. The Senate will be where the real action happens, the conversations happen with uh, key members of those committees uh, to make sure that the bills are scaled back uh, or addressed in a way that is going to be appropriate for um, being cognizant of all the concerns, all the implications uh, that we know our transit agencies have. Yeah. So let me get this clear. This is an unfunded mandate? That's right. So what are they thinking? <laughs> How can they possibly expect us to 
operate a system where it's unfunded. So what we've heard from Lorena Gonzalez, again, the, the uh, legislator who has introduced 1350, is that she does intend to come back with revisions to the bill that will speak to a funding component. Uh, and uh, relevant anecdote here is that her husband, uh, uh, Supervisor Nathan Fletcher from San Diego, happens to be the chair of San Diego MTS. She has made it absolutely clear that she's heard these concerns, <coughs> understand that funding needs to follow, but I think what's concerning is that the level of funding that would be required to actuate these bills is so large that no legislature, uh, no legislator, would rightly be able to capture that amount of funding. And so I think that's where our messaging is going to have to focus, is even if they were to give us an additional $25, $50 million, that's going to be a far short of what we're going to need to actually implement a bill like this. And that would hopefully get legislators across the spectrum to reconsider these bills. Yeah, but, uh, to what extent can help you started to collect that information from members um, and thank you Alex for being very responsive to our request. We've got um, estimates of the fiscal impact the Santa Cruz Metro as well as for the top 40 largest agencies across the state and then we've also gathered information about operational and legal implications of these things. And so those are the things that we're trying to collate to assimilate into a best chain that can be understood by folks in the legislature. Um, so we're, we're, we're working on it. Uh, but we're now just needing to transition into having those conversations in the Senate uh, with the key legislators who are being voting for these bills as they move through. Much let you jump in too. Hi, Jamie, Acting Planning uh, Director. And I just wanted to follow up on that. We did put together some um, preliminary data for. Uh, our um, partners at the state level, and uh, what we found was that our poll, if all three bills were passed, uh, would be about six million dollars of revenue. So, you know, multiplied across the state, it's a, it is a somewhat insurmountable uh, loss of revenue that has to be addressed in some fashion if we're going to go forward with any of these bills. Uh, but I just wanted to put some context on what we're talking about because six million dollars is not a, a, an amount of revenue that we can just absorb in terms of loss. Thank you. Well, yeah. If I, just, just to finish out, whatever you have that's in kind of user friendly form, I mean, it wouldn't hurt for us just to get this on the radar. Maybe it already is for our. Yeah, I, I don't mean to pile on, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> first of all, we, we are very fortunate to have the office of Josh Shaw up there mm -hmm. representing us. Very highly respected up there. Uh, <coughs> if these pass, you can kiss Metro goodbye. Mm -hmm. Period. <coughs> End of story. Uh, this is the only place they have done this. Um, I used to, I used to be one of them, I guess, so I got to be careful, but, you know, the unfunded band-aids, I just had a, this, we're not alone in this, the CSAC, California State Association of Counties, um, we had a, they had a two billion dollar unfunded band-aid on counties, and Governor Brown covered about a million two of that, but there's still eight million, eight hundred million outstanding, and so CSAC, it's, we're not alone in this. Uh, that the legislators have a habit of doing, of, you know, saying I passed this bill and how great it is, but I didn't give you the money for it, those under the mandates. Um, it's a huge problem, and yeah, I simply think that we should have a voice in what it uh, means to us in particular um, in the uh, most important conversation. So we'll come back to that in the at the end of the comments at the end of the finish the report. I mean, well, I was just going to make a quick comment. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just wanted to, to note that one of the things that we are mindful of in this space uh, is the impact on ADA and air transit service. Uh, that's something we are trying to focus on better understand. Uh, because of course we know that service is the most expensive that you all provide. And we want to make sure that we're moving forward in a judicious way to so not open up the floodgates and, and make this a situation where for many reasons, as you said, of Santa Cruz Metro may cease to exist if these bills were to move forward, we've got to find a way to address all the implications that exist from these bills. Um, so I'm going to highlight... Uh, that would be free fare of the other trends as well. That's the implication. At this point, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to highlight uh, several other bills. Um, the first is uh, a bus on the shoulder bill. And so this is a bill that is being carried by the California Transit Association with the support of a number of transit agencies across the state. 
And I, I want to acknowledge that the work that Santa Cruz Metro has done on Bus on Shoulder has really served to prime the pump for this hill. Folks are seeing that there's viability to the concept. They're seeing that there can be agreement between a Caltrans district and transit agency to make this, this type of project viable uh, here in the state. And so this bill uh, has luckily been taken up by the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, Jim Bell. And worth noting, when previous versions of this bill were introduced, he was actually a legislator who stopped those versions of the bill. So I want to just say thank you to Alex and his team for doing the good work to really um, lay the foundation for us to pursue this. And so in terms of what specifically this bill would do, it would create a new pilot program that <coughs> wouldn't touch Santa Cruz, Met Santa Cruz Metro's existing legislative authority. Uh, and this new program would authorize up to four new corridors, or I'm sorry, up to eight new corridors in the state um, to operate bus on shoulder. Four would be designated in Northern California, four would be designated in, in Southern California. And we are taking a corridor specific approach because we recognize that in parts of the state, both the transit agencies will use the same corridor. So we want to make sure that transit agencies collectively can experience the benefits uh, of this type of approach. And so the bill was just introduced as a spot bill, meaning that it's a placeholder bill. The substance of the bill will be introduced in uh, probably short of uh, three weeks. Uh, and then we'll be off to the races and hope to have great success with this bill. We've got a number of co-authors from across the state. Uh, so I think the winds are in the sales for this approach. So again, thank you, Santa Cruz Metro team, for all the work that you've done uh, to advance this concept. Next, I do want to highlight uh, a new bill uh, by Assemblymember uh, Calra uh, out of the College of San Jose um, that is looking to expand the type of uh, pre-procurement negotiations that happen between uh, transit agency management and labor. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the state put into place new requirements that uh, transit management consult their labor representatives um, to address issues like operator assaults um, and to address issues of blind spots on transit buses. Uh, when the bill was first introduced years ago, they were looking to do was to mandate that transit agencies include barriers on all their vehicles. And we happened to work with them with a collection of transit agencies in the state to walk that back to make it a consultation with your labor representatives to see what, what if anything can be done in this area to address those concerns. They're looking to expand that uh, statute to also include uh, the question of automation. Uh, and as transit agencies are looking at new technologies that may lead to automation, lead to potential jobs, job losses, the state legislature is interested in requiring that same type of consultation. Want to, want to be very careful to note there's no firm requirement that's built into the bill, but rather it's just a conversation that would have to happen between management and labor to understand what the implications of any new technology would be on uh, the labor <coughs> workforce. So, Mr. Chair, the next slide you've got is about funding, and there's a lot of details there. Because several of the funding programs impinge on or have to do with uh, transit agencies uh, accessing funds to deal with the electrification trend, which Michael will back clean up on. I'm going to frankly skip those in the name of time. And I'll just note, in the governor's proposed budget for the upcoming year, 2020-2021, uh, the revenue figures behind his proposed budget for transit suggest that the state transit assistance program, the very usually very predictable uh, formula-based program that goes out to all transit agencies and you get your share, uh, continues to be increasing slightly in the upcoming year. But uh, we would again note that Senate Bill 1 from 2017 more than doubled this program. You can see on the, the chart there, about $805 million statewide, and, you, and your share would go up slightly because of the increase. Other funding sources uh, that we want to talk about really do get to helping you reduce the cost of buying electric buses or putting in the charging infrastructure as you're in the middle of doing right now. And I will let Michael uh, uh, back clean up on those issues, and then, then we will be happy to uh, answer any questions, sir. So I want to start off the, the conversation about budgetary and regulatory actions with just acknowledging that the California Resources Board in December 2018 adopted a new rule to require transit agencies to transition to battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell technologies by 2040. 
And we understand from all of our conversations with the Santa Cruz Metro team, as well as transit agencies across the state, that one of the chief barriers to making that transition a reality is cost. And it comes down to capital costs and operations costs, of course, our workforce needs and, and so forth. Um, but we wanted to highlight a few of the things that we're, we're doing uh, on behalf of your agency to address some of those costs in particular. Um, so Josh had noted that uh, the governor's budget does have some monies uh, for zero emission uh, buses. Uh, he's offered $150 million in one type funding uh, to offset the incremental cost of these buses. We want to see that funding level increase. We've worked with uh, partners at the state level to better understand what the demand is for funding. It's about $250 million a year. And so the specific ask that we're advancing is $250 million, but ongoing. And ongoing because we understand that procurement takes multiple years. And you can't go about making procurement decisions not knowing if funding is going to be there in the next year. And so we're looking at something that would be an ongoing appropriation for multiple years. Um, we're looking at three to five as a way of providing some certainty to transit agencies that the funding will be there when they need it. Uh, and we also know that uh, operating costs, um, given the rate structures that exist today, are unfavorable to transit agencies that are transitioning to battery electric technology in particular. And so we've worked with the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, um, to get on their radar the need for a transit specific rate design. And that's an uh, idea that they are very receptive to. They've opened up a new proceeding where they want to look at exactly that. And so um, through, um, uh, through Santa Cruz Metro, um, through the, the broader transit agency uh, network, we are looking to advance a very specific rate design that will lower the cost of operating battery electric buses and hopefully make the proposition that I think many of you have been presented with, these buses are cheaper to operate, actually come true. Uh, and so I do want to highlight uh, a few other things that we are working on in the regulatory space. And uh, we heard earlier today about uh, PG&E and the fact that now they've got their, um, their public safety power shuttles and what that does to folks that need to operate battery electric buses. And so we've been working with the California Public Utilities uh, Commission again uh, to really emphasize the importance of grid resiliency and the need to consider how best to include transit agencies in the list of priority customers that they, uh, that they regulate. So to just give you a clear example, um, hospitals often have priority as customers because of the critical function that they play. We wanna see transit agencies brought to that same level because we know that oftentimes when these shutoffs happen, they coincide with things like wildfires, mudslides, things of that nature. And we need to make sure that transit agencies that have a core function of emergency response are able to carry out that function. And so again, there's receptivity to this idea, but it's gonna be something that plays out over the next year before we, we know exactly where we land, but this is, this is the goal. Uh, and then finally, um, I mentioned operating costs. While we're working on the utility rate end, the state does have a, a program called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, uh, which provides credits to transit agencies to offset some of the costs uh, for their electricity. Um, that has been difficult for a lot of transit agencies to take advantage of because there's administrative overhead that's associated with it that often comes at a higher cost than the amount of money that you claim in credits. And so we're posing to the state that they should create a state-run clearinghouse whereby they track the credits and they uh, sub-allocate to the transit agencies and they take on the administrative costs. Uh, and so that is an idea that is uh, still in its infancy, but we've had a number of really good conversations with folks in the governor's administration. They recognize the benefit of it, and for them I think it's just a matter of this has not been a concern that has been real because a lot of transit agencies weren't migrating to battery electric technologies. And now that we are, it's much more acute and there's, there's interest in this. Thanks, Mike. So, Mr. Chair, just to wrap up, clearly you had board members who expressed concerns about the fare-free bills and others who may want to talk about it. We're, we're, we'll talk with you all day. I want to note that we wanted to daylight those bills for you today. Um, of course, we'll take your, your CEO's lead, Julie's lead, board's lead, 
uh, we were hoping to get feedback and, and we're going to continue to work with your agency. Jamie has given us the stats that she mentioned to you. We want to continue to work with Alex to figure out, frankly, what is the exact best way to message this. So it's not, it wasn't on the agenda today for action, but presumably shortly after we continue and then finalize our analysis with your staff, Alex will be coming back and talking about the position. Of course, you can act whenever you want, as I understand it. But our hope was to, to have a little bit more time to parse through these issues, both technically in terms of operational impact on you, but frankly, the deep politics that Michael referenced that are problematic in Sacramento and try to thread our, our way through that. Kind of ditto on the call rate bill relative to the labor consultation. We want to uh, continue to work on that. The bus on shoulder bill is embedded in your uh, state legislative program that you adopted just before we came up, so probably automatically Metro may have a position on that, but we'll follow up with Alex on that. At this point, happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, so, <coughs> we'll the red light on is when it's on. So the, the couple of questions are, where is the League of Cities conversation about the uh, I mean, like said, the three passes? That's a start. And then just drafting the ask for the elected officials when it comes down to the community council levels um, when it's time. I, I would like to just second that because our cities uh, so much of our future planning is engaged in transit-related development, et cetera, so we have a pretty direct interest in the survival of the district. And so um, I guess the question is to what extent are you currently engaged or planning to be with the League of Cities and Counties? So and and, and when, we're, when will our engagement on this be helpful? Right. So relative to the two associations representing the municipalities, the bills, the fare-free bills are on their radar screen. When we get back to our office next week in Sacramento, we're actually convening a caucus of all the transportation lobbyists, including the lobbyists from CSAC and the lobbyists from the league, and we will put even more squarely, like it's on their radar screen, but we'll move it hopefully to the middle of their of their radar and ask for some help through their organizations from cities and counties. Of course, many cities operate as a municipal uh, uh, function, transit systems, as do counties. So we're all in this together. We need to. We'll we'll be on the you know, the front line is educating them on the potential impact after we get more data from around, from transit agencies around the state. So we're, that's a to-do. I can't say that they have positions yet, they don't, but we're gonna bring that to them and urge them to work with us on responding in the legislature. Um, the second part of your question, I apologize. Tell, well, them, tell us when it's appropriate to engage. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, very soon. Um, each, each of the three bills on the fair free that Michael mentioned are on slightly different tracks. The, the one for the young folks is, as he said, on a fast track, but it probably won't be heard for another month or so. So that's that period of finalizing our analysis, making sure our messaging is as strong as possible, and picking out the right uh, position. Is it straight opposed? Is it opposed unless amended? And there, and there would be specific you know, asks that we might make under that opposed unless amended. Um, so we want to make sure to give you the best advice. We need a couple more ways to do that as we finish the processing. But it's not, hey, you know, don't do not do anything for six months. We will be back and working with Alex, uh, if not back here, through your staff with a, with a, a affirmative suggestion probably within a month. Well, um, we have our lobbyists, obviously, counties and cities, and we're talking with them. But um, if it's helpful, uh, Alice can give you our direct contact for the jurisdictional representatives Good. here. And this makes it move a little faster. Yeah, that could be very helpful. Yeah. We will pull that lever if we find that it's otherwise going too slow at those other associations. Mm -hmm. And it's also a couple of days and all the time that they respond and ask are like so quick, so last minute that mm -hmm. we don't want to have it. So we don't want to just assume that it's right. going right. to tell us that right. this is what you need to do because we feel that by the time that they probably um, ask council for information, um, it's it's almost to the very edge of yeah. it, but I'd like to be able to be more proactive than, than them, even though there's a lot of other influence that they have with other council members that are here. So when they hear from the league, they want to respond, yep. but this is something that sounds to be more urgent than waiting for the league to tell yes. the council to respond. Understood. Clearly. Thank you. I think it also would be helpful to think about not just bringing us with our hair on fire to mm -hmm. talk to people, but uh, the constituents themselves, the biggest yeah. senior, the big parents, yeah. or kids and parents, or school uh, students from UCSC, 
who might go and talk to these folks and explain to them that they, you know, they, they think you're helping us think what you're doing in my service, right. and that might be much more effective even than the people from the agencies complaining that they're going to lose funding. That's a good strategy, and Mr. Chair, we've seen at least one of the authors of one of the bills when it was presented in committee had advocates in certain, you know, representing certain of the demographics on their side advocating for the bill. So a counterbalance uh, would be very important. Because I mean, PCS students will get this very quickly. I mean, they're they're between half and two thirds of our right. riders, and we would be cutting back on the rounds to the university because we couldn't fund them. I mean, that's the reality. That even last time we didn't want to do that. Because we made 12% cuts and tried to pull, keep them whole, but right. we can't do that with this kind of cut on top of them. We had 12% cut. We thought it was going to be 25%, but it ended up being about 12.5% that we, we cut in our service when we had a $6 million hole. Right. But that's because we got that $6 million down to a much lower number. We would have been at 25% if we had to like fill the whole thing by right. cutting routes. And that's what we're talking about, quarter of our service, and that's going to hit the very people that it's supposed to be helping. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to expand on what you just said. Um, turn back the clock five years ago when we were faced with a $6.2 million structural deficit. Um, we said at the outset that if we can't figure this out, we'll have to cut a third of our service and lay off a third of our bus drivers. That was going to be at least 24 bus drivers laid off. We resolved that issue through a combination of efforts. We found some efficiencies, the union postponed pay raises, but the huge remaining gap was bridged by two things, two major new funding sources, Measure DNSB1. Uh, and we were able to get through that crisis, balance our budget, no more structural deficit, uh, and a balanced budget. Um, if these three bills pass in their current state, um, not only will we have to cut at least a third, absent replacement revenue, we would have to cut at least a third to a half. This is not a sky's falling. This is not an exaggeration. This is at least a third to half of our service. Lay off at least that many, if not more, as we threatened before, you know, a third to <coughs> half of our bus drivers. Not to mention the consequences of the upside of all of this. The upside of all of this is more riders, right? That's, that's probably in part their goal. But more riders, less service requires, you know, impacts your buses. They're overloaded. You have to add service. Where are you going to get the money to add service? Because you just lost all the revenue. Plus you just kept your service. It is a huge downward spiral that would not be able to be recoverable. Um, these three bills have to be stopped. These are people that must not have ever sat on a transit board like you to try to put together a budget and understand how you deliver service with up to 20% or so coming from the fair box and the rest of it all from public subsidies. Are there other questions or comments? Bruce, I just, uh, okay. in the, uh, <coughs> the item after yours, uh, we're going to adopt an amendment for a free fair program for the legally blind. And we do that because we can afford it. We, we've worked at it for some time. I don't know how many other transit districts do this, but I think it would be nice to mention this and if there are others that are doing this, we do what we can for what we have. That would be a good selling point as well, along the way. If I might, Mr. Chair, uh, to, to Board Member McPherson, we, part of our development of messaging that will advantage you in our advocacy for Metro is collecting stories like that and saying to key <coughs> legislators who will be voting on these bills, transit agencies are already doing what they can to help certain of your writing demographics, where you've got the finances, where the policy makes sense locally, and uh, not to commit the the governor's administration, but early on, some of his staff have said there's no problem statewide. If there was some kind of problem locally, maybe it would, you know, it could be tailored to address some local problem. But they already understand it because we've given them the data on how many steep discounted fares there are for school kids, how many how many agencies are actually providing some free fares for certain of their riders. So we will keep telling those positive stories to try to push back against this view that there's a need to do this with a broad broad stroke. Yeah, just a quick question about the Senate Transportation Committee. To your knowledge, do any of the senators or any of their staff, are they subject matter experts uh, like a lot of the folks here and uh, at Metro are about being on the ground, uh, boots on the ground, operations of these? Uh, do, are, does that exist in that committee or 
it, it does uh, in a number of ways. There are elect through the assembly, the Senate Transportation Committee is our backstop and where we want to hone the exact way to deal with these these uh, impending challenges. Yes. Okay. And then one other question. I know you briefly touched on it. What's the and I'll just use what's the worst case scenario timeline in your mind yeah. about any of these going to effect? So just. Technically, the answer is August 31st is the last day for legislators to move bills through the process and to the governor. They, they adjourn for the year. The, the class, the current 2019-2020 class is done as of August 31st. The governor would have until the end of September to act on any of these bills. Uh, and as currently crafted anyway, they would, there's no time delay. They would go into effect January 1, 2021. Um, there's a number of folks talking about possible amendments, not the least of which is if somehow some version of any of these bills went through, putting off the, 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 the due date, the, the practical effect, you can write a bill right now that says this won't take effect until five years from now. Not that it makes the cost impact any better, but anticipation. Those are the kinds of detailed conversations that will take place behind the scenes with the Senate Transportation Committee. Thank you, folks. We appreciate Thank being you. down here. Uh, good morning. Uh, Jamie Ackman, Acting Director of Planning, Marketing, Communication. I don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was jumping the gun. No, please do the federal stuff. I got a PowerPoint if you just, you can just go through it, Jamie, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> we could do it that way. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me today. Uh, good news, no free fare bills in D.C. right now as of today. So good night, everyone. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> so, I uh, just wanted to, you know, kind of chat about a few things uh, uh, going on in Washington, D.C. That I, that I thought you might be interested in, and here's kind of a, a short list of, uh, of what's going on. Budget is always sort of an ongoing uh, thing, and then, of course, Fast Act reauthorization, uh, an issue with the 2020 census we have, and then wanted to talk about sort of the things that Metro is, is doing that are, that are special in Washington, D.C., uh, just like uh, Josh and Michael talking about how you guys kind of punch above your weight in Sacramento. Uh, do the same thing in Washington, D.C. So, uh, The FY 2020 DOT budget was approved at the end of last year uh, with, with the entire federal budget. Uh, and uh, as uh, Congress has done for the last couple of years, they rejected some pretty deep uh, recommended cuts to lots of programs at DOT. Uh, and, uh, and so we've got, for this current year, um, small increases in the formula program, about 2%, uh, and then uh, the what they call the, the plus-ups over the FAST Act authorized levels. Back in 2017, the FAST Act authorized levels for a lot of the bus bus facilities programs, these those sorts of things. Um, and so those were kind of set in stone because they're highway trust fund funded. Congress actually chose to add more money to this general fund money outside of the highway trust fund to those programs. So, uh, so thus the, the very goofy uh, congressional staff parlance of a plus up uh, over those levels. Uh, we're in year two of the stick program, uh, getting 2% of the section 5307 federal formula program. That was uh, when we started this program way back when in 2006, it was 1% and we've been sort of growing it ever since. And then again, this is a kind of another goofy uh, deal that, that Congress, uh, as a part of the 2020 budget, had to waive what they call the Rostenkowski test. And this is kind of a warning here, folks, because what the Rostenkowski test is, it's named after a, a, a chair, a former chair of the House Ways and Means Committee from the 80s, uh, who basically put it into law that if the Highway Trust Fund was not collecting enough to, um, you know, to, to keep you know, the, the authorized funding levels going, that there's an automatic, you know, across the board cut. And right now, the revenues into the Highway Trust Fund are not matching what, you know, what we're trying to spend on those programs. And so, uh, if, the, if Congress had not waived that Rostenkowski test, we'd have had a 12% across the board cut to all of these programs. So, um, and so that's kind of a, you know, again, sort of a warning as we go forward, this, that the Highway Trust Fund solvency continues to be a problem uh, for us. So. 
FY 2021 budget, uh, you know, just as soon as the 2020 budget ends, you start the 2021 season, and and the the first shot across the bow uh, shortly after the State of the Union, the President will uh, send his proposed budget up to Congress. The President did do that this year, and again for uh, for I guess the fourth year in a row, uh, it was pretty austere. Uh, had lots of um, lots of reductions, as you can see overall, a 19% reduction to the DOT budget. On the on the good end, he did sort of he did not propose any cuts to those fast act authorized levels that that Congress you know baked into the into the budget in 2015. So so that was a good thing, uh, but he instead sort of chose the the president sort of chose those general fund programs those funds those programs at DOT that are funded outside the highway trust fund so capital investment grants program which is uh, bus rapid transit uh, light rail streetcar projects that was uh, um, um, I guess essentially he would like to phase that program out uh, and end it uh, same thing with long distance Amtrak uh, and and passenger rail programs uh, we think, you know, Congress has rejected on a bipartisan basis those proposed cuts that the, the White House has, has made uh, or proposed, and uh, we expect that, that uh, Congress will, will do that again this year, uh, probably go through that process this summer. FAST Act reauthorization. The FAST Act, I can't even remember what the goofy acronym for FAST Act is, but F-A-S-T stands for something, Josh probably knows. <laughs> and, and back in 2015, you know, Congress, they, they've got to like do a little acronym for everything, you know, it's, it's tiring. <laughs> Whereas at the state, like everybody knows the, the, the legislation by their number, you know, like I, I, I hear Josh tick off and Michael, they tick off, you know, SB5, FB, and they know, all, I have no idea what these bill numbers are. They, Anywho, that's a different story. FAST Act was, re was authorized in 2015 uh, and, you know, essentially authorized, a, you know, kind of small increases to highway and transit programs over that, over that five-year period from, from 15 to 20. Uh, and uh, as we talked about before, Revenues into that trust fund are, are lagging, and so what they had to do was they had they stole some money from the Federal Reserve last time around, something like seventy billion dollars from some account that somebody in Congress found at the Federal Reserve. They had a, a, a and that's not there anymore. You know that's you know, so Congress is going to have to come up with something. We're estimating that they're going to need at least a hundred billion dollars in additional revenues just to fund the programs at their current levels. Again, because of those revenues into the trust fund. So. Not sure where we're going to find that, but uh, but that's sort of the big you know the big kahuna in all of these these discussions. Uh, technically, the um, the Fast Act expires in September of this year. Uh, I wouldn't expect it to be fully authorized this year. It's an election year again, needing those extra revenues. You're going to have to talk about gas tax increases and things like that. I don't think people are going to want to touch that in an election year. So we'll probably see some sort of extension at least into 2021. Along with the discussions of, of the FAST Act, House Democrats and the White House, I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, recently decided to make their own sort of pitches on infrastructure. If you remember last year, there was for a split second, we thought there was going to be a bipartisan agreement on infrastructure. The President, the Speaker of the House, we're going to talk about $2 billion, and then the next day, nothing. <laughs> you know, it's gone. Uh, the, uh, the, the White House and the Speaker, uh, the White House basically said, well, we can talk about this $2 uh, trillion dollar, um, uh, package, but uh, you have to stop investigating me. And so that's where, th that's where things kind of ended. So now the House Democrats are still kind of, they're, they're trying to push along. I don't have a lot of uh, I don't have a lot of faith that this is going to be enacted this year uh, because we're not working bipartisan here, but the House Democrats in, um, have, have introduced some guidelines for what they think is kind of a five-year infrastructure package, uh, and there's a transportation component of it, there's an energy component of it, there's a telecom component of it, uh, you know, broadband uh, water infrastructure part of it, but the transportation part of it talks about, um, you know, putting an additional $50 billion over over that fast act baseline for programs over the next five years, 40 billion for rail over the next five years. Lots of talk about clean energy and, and incentives and programs for, for green uh, stuff. The other interesting one is, is, is the, House, the House Democrats, and they haven't put any legislative language behind it, but they're talking about local control over investment, which is really interesting in that, uh, you know, DOT likes to give money to states. You know, there's only 50 of them, and they can just sort of, you know, distribute it that way. Um, it looks 
like uh, it looks like the, at least the House Democrats would like to do uh, something different with regard to that. And then uh, improving kind of financing mechanisms. And we've talked about some of these programs in the past. Loan programs like TIFIA back in the uh, uh, the uh, 2009 Recovery Act uh, from the Obama administration. They created these Build America bonds, which were taxable bonds that local governments could issue and then get uh, a rebate from. Thinking about sort of bringing those back. Uh, under under a, a, an infrastructure package. Yeah, and then there, there was another problem too in that um, that the the rebates to the you know to the local governments were uh, subject to the the federal sequester when we were under this sort of budget control act and so every year you know the rebate you got a little you know haircut on that so uh, it, yeah they, it wasn't exactly a, a, the success that they were hoping so hoping you can improve it. The White House budget, uh, you know, in addition to those, you know, sort of cuts, uh, did have kind of a broad outline of what they wanted to do with a, uh, with a, uh, uh, a, a, an infrastructure bill. The transportation portion of it was pretty highway heavy, uh, and it matches a, a Senate highway bill that was introduced uh, last year as far as funding levels for it. Uh, and then you can see, in addition to sort of the current programs that uh, you know that were funding th this this infrastructure plan that the White House um, floated talking about 60 billion for what they would call mega projects which I think you know are kind of multi-state multi-region gigantic you know big big uh, numbers a freight program a bridge program rural America has been a real uh, focus for DOT over the last few years the secretary um, of transportation's husband uh, happens to be a senator from Kentucky and uh, she believes that rural America has been left behind with regard to transportation funding, and so uh, that's uh, that's another focus there. And then the the only real transit aspect of that of the the White House proposal that was that was in any uh, real um, you know that provided any anything close to specifics was this state of good repair sprint program which they were kind of talking about flooding the you know I, and I think this 20 billion was like a one-year thing kind of flooding the zone with lots of money for uh, transit agencies to up their state of good repair but again not a, not a lot of detail uh, on that so uh, as I said before with fast act uh, and, and and infrastructure the bipartisan discussions uh, with King Democrats in Congress and the White House have broken down where we would expect the House and Senate to try to move some proposals this year. Um, uh, I don't, again, I don't think that they're going to happen because uh, we talk about this election year kind of making the calendar really tight. Somebody was telling me the other day uh, on Capitol Hill that if you know if you if you don't have something ready to move by July 4th, um, you know, forget about it until after the election, sort of thing. So it's, and that's coming up pretty soon. So, but you know, uh, you know, with with regard to all of this, the you know the biggest barrier to to you know to finishing this thing you know up is is this: it's money. Uh, we need to figure out a way to fund these programs, and it, whether it be a gas tax increase or looking at this vehicle miles traveled, where you put the black box on the car and you pay by that, uh, having electric vehicles, some sort of, of, of fee on electric vehicles, those are the sorts of things that Congress is looking at. They're not very far ahead on it. You know, there's not a lot, I don't think there's a lot of data that's available to, um, and, and as a result, we've got you know the gas tax, and an election year makes it hard to to raise the gas tax. Some, some Senate Republic, I'm sorry. Yeah, thirty. About, yeah, it's been about thirty years. So there's some talk. Even some Republicans in the Senate were talking about, well, we might be able to buy into indexing it for inflation. I mean, that you know, a lot of our problems could have been solved if back when they you know ra raised the gas tax last, they indexed it. You know, but uh, they didn't. They didn't go that far. But. Uh, so that's that's going to be the big discussion, uh, you know, how to how to fund this how to fund this stuff. So this year, you guys know that the uh, Census Bureau is doing, uh, you know, their their decennial count, and uh, there is some some concern that we have with regard to what happens after uh, the census is done. Um, Every 10 years, the Census Bureau tries to reclassify what they call their urbanized areas. And it's basically a map making exercise, you know, where the Census Bureau says, you know, here's an urban area, this is rural, and they, they create these urbanized areas. Um, the only federal programs that we can find that actually use that urbanized area classification to distribute funding is FTA formula funds. 
And so as you guys probably know, um, Santa Cruz Metro serves a couple of UZAs, urbanized areas. All of them are under population of 200,000, the Santa Cruz, the Watsonville. Um, and in 2010, the Census Bureau tried to combine, some of you may remember this, the Watsonville, Santa Cruz, and Salinas urbanized areas into one larger urbanized area. What that would have done is would, you know, would have exceeded the population of the of, of metro service area above 200,000. That does two things. It uh, prevents us from being able to use federal funding on operations. And we don't qualify for the stick program that we created and benefit so much from, about $2 million a year. Now, on the other hand, going over 200,000, the formula program for transit agencies over 200,000 does take into consideration ridership numbers, which the formula under 200,000 does not, which is the reason we created the stick. So there might be a little bump up in formula funding with regard to that, but um, I think we would rather, you know, at least, you know, talking to the CEO and other staff, we'd, we'd like to stay under 200,000 if we can. And so uh, last time around, Congressman Farr and others in Congress sort of uh, yelled very loudly at the Census Bureau, don't redo these urbanized areas. They stood, they stood down. Uh, but I imagine that there's going to be talk about trying to do it again, and, and hopefully Congress will be able to fight this. Um, but, uh, but that's something we're watching very, very closely, and I know it's kind of, you know, kind of a weird little situation, but, uh, but we, we, we would not want to fall below. Yes, ma'am. It is, and, and we're not alone. I think, you know, we have friends, uh, and I think that, um, I, you know, I've heard from, I, I've been sort of trying to, what I don't want to do is I don't want to go over to the Census Bureau and say, hey, are you going to redo UZAs, and then have them say, oh, we didn't think about that. Maybe we'll do that. <laughs> so, but I, I, in talking to sort of folks on Capitol Hill, they seem to feel that, that the Census Bureau, and, you know, this is 10 years ago, so maybe not everybody is there, but they seem to think, they were, they were surprised at the blowback that they got over the, the, the reclassification. And so they're thinking, again, given that there's really not a huge impact on, on reclassifying, it's, it's simply, again, like I talked about, it was a map making exercise, that they're gonna hold off. And that, that some members of Congress have sort of gone to census and said, hey, you know, we'd prefer you not do this. So. Um, so that's, you know, Congressman Panetta is aware of all of this. Uh, Congresswoman Eshu is aware of all of this, and they, they're keeping an eye on this as well. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, so that's census. And then, you know, the last thing I just, you know, again, wanted to talk about how Metro is, is making an impact on, on, uh, on Washington, in Washington, D.C. So a little over a year ago, I believe the CEO was in town for an APTA legislative committee meeting. We went up and we met with Congressman Panetta's new uh, staff that handles tax issues. The congressman was appointed to the really powerful House Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over tax issues, and talked about, you know, sort of program, we, we, and most of the time what we talked about was the alternative fuels tax credit, which, as you know, we, we get about $600,000 a year from. Is that where we're at now, now Debbie? Um, and uh, Congress has trouble um, extending that tax uh, credit every year. So we were talking about that, but we were also talking about electric buses. And Alex was talking about a, the plan, well, we would love to have our fleet be all electric as soon as possible, but financial constraints, you know, we're kind of layering, you know, I, I know Alex talks about layering the, the bus purchases between CNG and, and electric because of the delta between the cost of an electric bus and a CNG bus. And so, Later on in the year, we get a call from the, uh, um, from the Congressman's office saying, the House Ways and Means Committee is putting together a green energy package. Love to try to do something that could, that could help with that. And so what he has come up with in conversations with us, you know, we of course asked for the moon, uh, <laughs> you know, or a fundable tax credit that we could get, you know, for, you know, for the purchase of an electric bus. 
uh, staff and other members of the, the Ways and Means Committee kind of we did a lot of push and pull. And what we came down with was his proposal to provide manufacturers a 10% tax uh, credit for the production of electric buses. And again, sort of the strong, like Alex was saying, mentioning earlier, the strong implication is that that 10% is passed on to uh, the purchases. So again, like I said, that's, and that's something that, um, uh, that a, a lot of folks um, got included in this big green energy package and, and folks are supportive of it. We're also looking to increase the stick program from that 2% of the 5307 formula program to 3%. Uh, sounds like a small uh, increase, but it's but you know the dollars add up. It's uh, uh, that that program is um, is well funded. So 3% of of that. I think right right now we're we're at uh, somewhere around 80 million dollars for that pot of stick money. So it would, it would increase, uh, and we do very well with that. Uh, and so Congressman Panetta, again, is a leader in introducing legislation to increase that. We hope that that will be part of the FAST Act reauthorization uh, bill that's ultimately approved. Uh, they, uh, we don't seem to be getting any pushback on that, so that's increased funding for us there. And then APTA, you know, which of course is sort of the you know, kind of the, the major uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, advocate for uh, transit agencies. And they've got a, a long and winding process to uh, come up with their principles for reauthorization. Uh, and we've been trying to be as uh, involved in that as possible so that they don't forget sort of the, these, you know, these small agencies that, that again, punch above their weight and, and recognizing that. And, and, I think, and I think we've done a good job, their principles. Uh, for instance, the, the, the STIC program was, was sort of a bugaboo with, with APTA for a long time because they thought, oh well, it's taking away money for, from larger agencies, and um, we've got it into their into the the, the increase for stick into their um, legislative proposal now. So it's, it's among some of our our good victories. So I think that was all I had. I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys had. Hopefully, uh, some of this made sense. <laughs> I think we're looking at 2021 for the major stuff. For a budget, an FY21 budget, they have to do that. And so they will eventually do that. But I think sort of the big policy changes and, and uh, funding uh, discussions will probably have to wait until, until 2021. And there won't be any kind of shutdown because they'll, they'll not want to do that uh, right before an election. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, it, you, can, you can never tell. But I, I will say that we are we continue to, to, you know, while nothing's going to happen in probably in 2020, it's important to uh, to continue to you know to work with these you know the committee. They're drafting legislation now. We want to be in on the on the ground floor to make sure that you know nothing's going to hurt us or and and hopefully will help us. So so it'll be it'll be a busy year. It'll just be frustrating because uh, Congress will kind of shut down <laughs> sometime this summer. Yeah, I mean, what was interesting when we got Bobby last, last year was how honest everybody was about how hopeless it was. We used to go talk to politicians in Washington, and there's some hope here in the future. Right. Thanks for coming. We're doing our best, and then we get stuff for you. We're like, oh, it's hopeless. There's nothing we can do. We're not moving anywhere. And, and, uh, and many of them are honest. It's not just the other folks. It's us, too. I mean, yep. there's a game going on, and both parties are pointing to this. That's not the comment about the party you're responsible for in the picture, but right. as far as transit, it's not getting help from anybody that's responsible. Thank you for your work there. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be sending delegates and interview. Looking forward to seeing you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have your own. Okay. So as you know, uh, in January, we brought a brief update uh, regarding the free fare program uh, in its first few months of existence. Um, and uh, our, all indications were that things continue to run smoothly. Uh, the committee had asked that we continue to solicit 
feedback from uh, customers who would be interested in this policy or who are currently using um, the access pass and uh, and we have continued to do that we have not received any complaints about this pass we have received some questions from customers who maybe didn't quite understand um, the target group for it we've um, received questions from bus operators who see ways that it can um, operate more efficiently and we really appreciate that feedback but uh, overall I would say it continues to be a pretty smooth success um, and we continue to see incrementally small numbers of new applications rolling in, um, I would say, on the average of two to three a month uh, for customers who are eligible for the program. However, we are bringing to you just a few updates um, to the program. Um, there were some edits that needed to be done um, just to clean up the policy language, make sure it accurately reflected um, exactly how we were going about uh, allocating these cards. Um, and some of these edits were also uh, recommended by plaintiff counsel who had an opportunity to review this and uh, provide feedback. Um, so uh, with that, I am open to any questions you might have about the policy. I don't know if our legal counsel wanted to add anything uh, regarding the discussions with the plaintiff's counsel on this subject. That's accurate. If, if a person presents as obviously visually impaired in some way, the bus operator has the latitude to make the decision to just allow them on regardless of whether they have this pass. This pass is really more for the protection of the customer who may not present as visually impaired but is visually impaired and wants to make sure that they can get their um, free uh, access card um, in order to ride with all of the benefits that that entails. Yes. That's right. That's right. We're, we're, we're trying to make this a, a, we want this to be friendly, not just for the, the community, but for our bus operators, because obviously they don't want to reject anyone who um, has the right to ride. So they want to make sure they're being very careful about the way that they, um, you know, accept these passes. Um, so we haven't had um, a, a huge number of activities around the Pacific Station project in the last uh, month or so. Uh, uh, right around the holidays, we submitted our draft comments on an MOU with the city. Um, they have spent, we had a meeting with them to review that, uh, those comments uh, earlier this month. And just yesterday, the city sent back their um, uh, edits to our comments. So we haven't had a chance to look at those edits and review them with our general counsel. And I expect that we'll have a more fulsome update on this process uh, next month at the committee meetings and board meetings. It's really critical. I mean, at some point we're coming to a push the button 
<laughs> the stage on this. And um, my own feeling is that uh, there's there's so much potential for the Pacific Station, um, but um, we really need to um, uh, get the MOU in place and start um, uh, talking about the specifics. So I'm just going to say that openly. <laughs> is, is this item on the agenda of your committee? The, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's just always while well, we're still talking. No, no, but so, I'm saying, but there's an item there which you can get. To the I, I really think we need that. to get very specific at the capital committee okay. and um, get a complete report. Hopefully, have city people here to speak in real time to the committee members um, and not just keep hunting on that thing. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments from you? Anybody in the public want to find on this? I don't believe we have any action to on this. We have an update from the department. <coughs> Next, we're on to uh, <coughs> review of our items in closed session. Just one personnel matter. One personnel matter. Does anybody want to comment to us on the one personnel matter that we're going to? Then we are adjourned, or actually recessed to our closed session.